Good evening, everyone. I'm Doug Elmendorf, Dean of Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm delighted to welcome you for tonight's program on race and justice in the age of Obama. This program addresses fundamental challenges facing the United States. The tragic deaths associated with policing that have received so much attention in the past few years are one stark manifestation of those challenges. But the true challenges are much broader and deeper, as you know. In a message to the Kennedy School community this summer, I quoted from President Obama's moving speech in Dallas. And he said, as you may remember, faced with this violence, we wonder if the divides of race in this country can ever be bridged. I understand how Americans are feeling. But Dallas, I'm here to say we must reject such despair." Unquote. I'm very pleased that so many members of the Kennedy School community are not despairing, but instead are engaged in research, thinking, and dialogue about these challenges. A few weeks ago, we had a hard but interesting discussion about race, policing, and social justice with three members of our faculty at the front of a room but other faculty members, many students, many staff people filling the rest of the room. And next month, we'll have a similar discussion about race, incarceration, and poverty, again anchored by three different faculty members. But the Kennedy School is an outward-facing, not inward-facing place. And we address public challenges, not on our own, but by engaging with people outside the school, across the country, sometimes across the world, who are addressing those same challenges. So we are hosting, over the next few days, this important symposium where we can talk with and learn from distinguished and accomplished guests like those on the stage behind me. I will leave their introductions to our moderator. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsors of tonight's program, Within the Kennedy School, this means the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, the Wiener Center for Social Policy, the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, and of course, the Institute of Politics. We are joined in a sponsorship by Harvard's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Our moderator tonight is my impressive colleague, Leah wright Rigur. Leah is Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the Kennedy School. She is a historian by training, and her courses, professional writing, and commentary on current events draw importantly on historical context. She teaches courses on race and public policy in modern America. Her recent book is titled The Loneliness of the Black Republican, Pragmatic Politics and the Pursuit of Power. And in the book, she covers the ideas and actions of black Republican activists, politicians, and officials over the past four decades. Please join me in giving Leah and her guests a warm welcome. Thank you all. So thank you so much to our dean for that really just wonderful welcome and that, that very generous introduction. Um, uh, just for, for the record, my book is not a memoir, um, <laughs> but is a scholarly, scholarly <laughs> assessment. Um, scholarly assessment of the, the last uh, 80 or so years. Um, but I want to start off by saying that it is a privilege and an honor to be here tonight and to welcome you all to the very first event, the kickoff event in our Race and Justice in the Age of Obama conference. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to our three panelists and to moderate a conversation on President Obama's legacy on matters of race and issues of justice. Now, the significance of this moment cannot be overstated. At this critical social and political moment, the Kennedy School has an opportunity and an obligation to use our platform to weigh in on the impact of our nation's first black president. Over the next day and a half, you'll hear from more than a dozen speakers of varying ideological backgrounds who are practitioners, journalists, academics, and activists. They'll speak about race, policy, politics, civil rights, and many will offer policy and political solutions for the next occupant of the White House. In some ways, this is what makes the Kennedy School so unique. 
Not only are we one of the first institutions to tackle race justice and the legacy of Barack Obama, we are also invested in hearing from a diverse set of people and perspectives whose opinions and arguments often reflect divergent points of view. All are eager to wrestle with Obama's legacy on matters of race. And in an era of polarization and partisanship, dialogues such as these are critical. Now, I'm a historian by training. And if you know any historians, then you also know that we're very squeamish about assessing legacies before the president has even left the White House. We like to joke that there's no use in analyzing matters, such matters, until about 20 or 30 years from now. But it's true that in 20 or 30 years, we may assess the Obama presidency very differently. But as I sit here with my history hat on, I also have my policy and politics hat on. And I can also say that there's tremendous value and tremendous weight in examining Barack Obama's impact on race and justice, particularly as we consider the future of our nation. I really urge the audience to think about the ways in which the Kennedy School's mission compels a kind of urgency around this conference. Our goal here is to educate and train future public leaders and to generate ideas that provide solutions to the nation's most challenging public problems. Now tonight, our wonderful panelists will help us do exactly that by laying the groundwork for the conference and helping us to shape our conversation on the historical legacy and the impact, for better or for worse, of a historic president. Now with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. I'm going to start off uh, with uh, Mr. Paul Montero. Mr. Montero is the acting director for community relations at the US Department of Justice and the former public engagement advisor in the White House Office of Public Engagement. Our next panelist is Brittany Packnett, recently named number three on the Politico 50 annual list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics in 2016. Ms. Packnett is Teach for America's Vice President of National Community Alliances, the co-founder of Campaign Zero, and served on the White House Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Last but not least is Ovik Roy of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity and an editor at Forbes. Mr. Roy is also a former senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and has served as an advisor to politicians including Marco Rubio, Rick Perry, and Mitt Romney. Um, he also has a pretty interesting interview out that is in the Atlantic's assessment of the November 2016 election. I encourage everyone to take a look. Um, now I'd like to start out our discussion by asking each of the panelists, and I think we can start uh, with Ovik, asking each of the panelists maybe to say a few of their thoughts, general thoughts, um, on uh, the impact of Barack Obama and his legacy. So we'll start with Ovik. Well, I love the way Leo, you framed it in terms of thinking about what the legacy will look like 20 to 30 years from now. Because I, I think that 20 to 30 years from now, President Obama's legacy is going to look a lot better, uh, even to nonpartisan observers, than it did today on issues of, of race. Because uh, if you actually look at his speeches, like the speech that Dean Embledorf uh, mentioned earlier today, they're remarkably fair, they're remarkably thoughtful. And I think as time goes on, we're going to see how he handled incredibly difficult situations with a lot of grace, a lot of fairness, trying to really represent uh, both sides or, or multiple sides of the tensions that people feel, the different points of view uh, on, uh, on issues like uh, what, ha what have been, we've been seeing in the last couple of years with policing. Uh, and he's carried himself with such impressive uh, dignity, I think, through these situations, as we have other presidents who may not uh, always carry themselves with that level of dignity. I think people will look back and, and look fondly uh, at, at his legacy in that regard. But most importantly, again, from his campaign in 2008, throughout, through, through all the episodes uh, that, uh, that he went through, certainly on the right there was a lot of hostility. He would, he would give the speech in Dallas and there would be this incredible protest. Well, he's dividing us, you know, he's, 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 he's being incredibly antagonistic, which was totally, in, in my view, disconnected from the actual uh, text and content of, of the speeches that he was delivering. Uh, and I think as time goes on and we are in this political moment and can assess that more soberly, I, I believe his reputation will increase. So I um, am, am not a historian in the scholarly sense. It was my That's college okay. major. Okay. But, <laughs> um, but, the, but, but I, I say that because um, I come from a space of activism in terms of my, my own personal engagement with the White House. 
And the first time that I met the president was December 2014. Um, was actually at a protest helping us shut down a mall on Black Friday of that year when the White House called, which was like a weird thing because you're on the phone with the White House staffer and people are drumming in the background and shouting, no justice, no peace, which is where I was. Um, and so there was a, it was, we all had this sense, there were about eight of us that ended up in this Oval Office meeting that lasted about three times as long as it was supposed to. And there was, all, at all times, this kind of dueling um, reality. Um, on the one hand, there was this clear sense that our presence in the room, myself, people like Rasheen Aldridge, who's an activist from St. Louis, who may say a lot from the Dream Defenders in Miami, um, that our presence there was in and of itself an act of resistance, right, which is a comment on race and justice uh, during, during this legacy. Um, all black and brown folks in that room, um, including himself and Valerie Jarrett and his staff member at the time. And so it was clear that we were a part of something historic and part of a conversation that had someone else been president, we would not have been invited into that space. And that there was also um, a legitimizing, if you will, of, of the discipline and the practice of organizing and activism. And if you remember back to 2008, the number of attacks that he got that organizing wasn't a real job, right? Uh, that we suddenly were here um, six, seven years later having a conversation with a bunch of organizers and activists that have made the world pay attention to something. I don't know that another president would have done that. And yet the conversation was very earnest. And so on the other side, the feeling was very clear that there were folks in the room and folks being represented by those of us in the room who uh, felt frustrated, who felt like the president wasn't going far enough, wasn't um, reaching into um, the depths of the, what we assumed to be his own personal truth about how he's experienced life as a black man. And so we made very um, clear requests around policing, around demilitarizing police because of the ways that milita militarized equipment is being used specifically on black bodies um, in, in the course of protest, but also around the bully pulpit that he has, which is a challenge, right? The challenge that you're, you were speaking to, um, that he would speak more earnestly to his experience as a black man as it reflects so, the experience of so many of us sitting in that room. Um, and so I think that as time moves on, we uh, in the activist community certainly will experience a difference because this is the first, not only was this the first African American president, this is the first time we will transition from an African American president to a white president, right? Which will be a, a different kind of experience for all of us and how that White House engages with us. Um, but it will, I think it will also force us to reckon with what our own leadership looks like as black folks um, because it complicates this notion that there is one kind of black leader. Are, are you another Barack Obama? Or are you a Fannie Lou Hamer? Or are you a Kwame Ture, right? And so um, lots of, of competing thoughts. I don't have a pretty bow to tie on it, but um, <laughs> certainly lots of things swirling around in our personal experience of his leadership. Paul. I would agree in some of the disclaimers around sort of the, the, the caution you should have in trying to sort of write the legacy while it's still being made. Um, that being said, having the privilege of seeing him come from the Senate to today, somebody who always took the long view, who was always thinking 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, to, to the point of sort of avoiding the short-term political thinking that to some degree resulted in some of the policies that he has worked on changing the last eight years, um, intentionally giving sort of young folks like me chances to work at a federal level in the administration, um, excited to see sort of this cadre of folks come out of eight years of a African-American presidency and what we'll do next, having the opportunity afforded by someone who is thinking ahead after he's done, you know, who's taking up the baton inside government and outside government. Um, and the sense that he's not done, you know, the, the, the idea that both the president and the first lady, relatively young for a former president and former first lady, um, who have the world before them, um, who are in a position where they can work on the issues that motivate them even after they, they leave government. Um, and, and the issues that he's picked up that, again, going back to the long-term thinking, there were a lot of reasons not to pick them up, but he did anyway, um, and at least tried to begin a process of turning the ship of state to a place that uh, was more pointed toward justice. Some of the issues where there's certainly political downsides to talking about them. Um, and this sort of X factor in my mind, and I don't know how it'll play out, but I saw it with my peers when President Reagan died. Sort of, he was the president when 
you sort of figured out television and you were watching it. The first time you saw a president, it was Ronald Reagan. So when he passed, um, there was a sadness there. Regardless of political affiliation, there was a sadness because that was the president. The idea that for the last eight years, the people, the children now, that in 20 years will be voting age adults, you know, their concept of African Americans, having grown up with my first impression of a president or a first lady was Barack Hussein Obama or Michelle Obama. And what that means, you know, when you get into the deep issues of uh, a system of racial inferiority or a theory of racial superiority, it doesn't work so well when you know the president of the United States could be a man named Barack Hussein Obama and Michelle Obama could be the first lady and have the, the class and integrity and, uh, and leadership that they've given to the country. Um, so that's, there's so many unknowns, but I think history will be kind to them. Um, so I thought we could also, we could, we could really jump into things <coughs> by thinking about exactly what, what actually many of you ta uh, touched on, about the idea of the, uh, the impact of the nation on the nation of having a black president. But not just from the symbolism of the moment, right? but also from the impact on policy, on Congress, on constituents, on voters, on the two-party system, on social movements, really just kind of a, a more expansive definition of the nation. And I know that this is, uh, this is a pretty large question, but I think it's one that's worth considering, given that under Obama in particular, we've seen the eruption of various very intense uh, social and political movements of the left, the right, and otherwise, right? The Tea Party movement, Occupy Wall Street, birtherism, Black Lives Matter, right? So, I was wondering if you guys could weigh in a little bit about this idea about what is it, what has his impact actually been as a black man in the White House? So maybe Ovik, we'll start with you. Well, let me talk about economic policy because I think that's an area where uh, uh, I would say, as, as someone who just said some nice things about the president, where uh, I might be more critical. I think that if we look at the last eight years economically, uh, the fortunes of people who are lower on the income scale, lower on the wealth scale, have been fairly stagnant. People who are very wealthy have done very well because the Federal Reserve has had very low interest rates. So if you had investments in the stock market or in real estate or other uh, securities, you did very, very well in the last eight years. Uh, so I think for all of the, the idealism and rhetoric around income inequality and uh, and you, you know, someone who I think in terms of his philosophy was committed to the idea of, of resolving income inequality, lifting people out of poverty. Uh, there, in terms of actual ca cash and wage incomes, uh, that there was actually a very sluggish recovery from the recession and fairly stagnant incomes at the bottom end of the spectrum. There are a lot of people who are being left behind as people at the high end, people like the people in this room, college educated individuals, people who are fluent with technology are doing incredibly well. Um, and I think that's a problem and a legacy that uh, his successor will have to see if uh, he or she has better solutions for. Brittany? So I'm thinking about two things. Uh, one is a bit of a black cultural renaissance that we're witnessing right now. And I don't give all of that to the White House. I absolutely think that that is happening in conjunction with this current protest movement as well. Uh, but you know, I watched Atlanta last night on FX. Queen Sugar will be on my DVR. I will watch um, 13th on, on uh, when, when I get home. I'm trying to get my mind ready to watch this film, but um, by, by Ava DuVernay. And we could go on and on. I was at the, the White House two Mondays ago uh, for South by South Lawn, and we, we swa they swag surfed on the White House lawn, which the students know what I'm talking about. Uh, um, and the running joke was like, it'll never be this black again, right? <laughs> um, it was like D'Angelo playing and then Swag Surf comes on. Um, and I, and I, I say that in a joking manner, but I'm also thinking about all of the awards that have been given, the, the ways in which Black History Month has looked very different at the White House. I mean, you've got Debbie Allen and Fatima Robinson showing at these kind of places. That matters. That kind of black representation matters. And like I said, I don't give all of that credit to the White House. There's certainly that kind of cultural renaissance representation happening all over this country, especially as a part of this current protest movement. 
Um, but to your point, there are young people who have only ever known a, a black president and a black first lady. And similarly, um, they're the same young people who have only ever known these kind of cultural representations being centered in a way that, again, offers them real legitimacy in the American canon, right? That it's not just the stuff of black people, that it is actually that you know all of these folks are American treasures and our art forms are American treasures. And I think that's important. When I think about what you said, though, about um, his presence and the impact on social movements, I do think that that point about complicating what black leadership can look like is important. Um, it, over the last two or three years, um, I have watched peers, colleagues, folks that I have come to know over the last few years decide whether or not they wanted to follow that same form of leadership or not. Um, and uh, I think that it is necessary for social movements to have incredibly broad spectrums of, of, of philosophical beliefs around how we should move forward because that enriches, enriches all of us. Um, and I think that he's helped contribute to that. The last thing that I'll say though is that especially around this movement, there are lots of things that I still believe need to be done. A full scale demilitar demilitarization of the police. Um, I believe that grant making should be restricted to, from um, police departments that have proven themselves unworthy. And yet there, is a way in which he and this White House have brought this conversation into people's living rooms that may not have happened otherwise. Um, and it matters that there were a lot of African American White House staffers that were helping to make that possible. Um, but talking about this press conference after press conference, talking about it from his own personal experience and the experience of those he knows, forming a task force that yes, is imperfect, but at least places our voices um, in a conversation about policy on policing. Myself, Brian Stevenson, Connie Rice over at the Advancement Project who began her career by suing the LAPD multiple times. That stuff matters. Um, and would I like it to go further? Absolutely. But there's a, a centering of certain voices, certain art forms, and certain traditions um, that this White House has done intentionally that I think have been really important. Paul. Yeah, I think the, in terms of the moment we're living in with the, the changing face of activism, and this is something that the first campaign in 08 took advantage of in terms of having a lot of folks of a lot of different ages and backgrounds sort of feeling a sense of ownership and getting involved when the stakes were not in his favor of even getting out of the primary, um, but a sense of agency. And once they came to the table and once the election was over, there was still a sense of, I have, st I have something to say about this policy issue, that policy issue, and I'm going to say it. Um, and just looking at recent history in the last 50 years, maybe further back, that's always the nature of it. There's always sort of the institutional players that speak for communities, and then along comes the new ones that sort of challenge the status quo feel like the institutional group maybe doesn't speak for everyone, there needs to be another voice, and they create their own space. And with a lot of these, you know, people call them autonomous organizations, whatever you want to call them, the sort of Occupy Wall Street flat organizations where you're, you're looking for who's in charge, it's like everyone's in charge. Who do you speak for? I speak for me. I don't speak for anyone else. Um, by design, sort of being a, an organization that is, is very flat um, and, and can take a view on this issue and that issue. And, um, there are challenges with that, but um, I think the, his campaigns took advantage of the fact that so many more people had a sense of agency. They wanted to be involved. They felt like they had something to contribute. It was their place to speak up, um, to either affirm or criticize him you know, while he's in the White House, and even while he's been president, I think, leaving space for people that disagree with him. Um, and knowing how this works in the sense of there's a, there's a, a lot of upside to having folks push you to do the right thing, creating space for you to do the right thing or the thing that the groups you know, think is right. So um, that's the way it's worked for a long time. And I think it's, it is a very um, sort of uh, uh, fragile moment right now with a lot of uh, uh, anger out there when you get into the issue of, of people are dying um, in the streets, in communities, um, uh, under a fact pattern that seems to happen much too often, um, and uh, wh where's the response? What's going to happen? And we're gonna push that conversation to the forefront. You can't ignore it. You have to answer the questions. Um, and I think taking advantage of the moment of more people feel like they belong in this public square. It's not for someone else to speak up or that organization to speak for you. It's for you to speak for you using whatever platforms you have. Um, and on the e economy, certainly I'm not an expert on that. I just you know would throw out sort of coming in at the beginning of 09, you know, 
uh, and in terms of where we are today, the, the economic picture is better than it was at the you know, end of the last presidential administration. Certainly a, a lot more progress that has to happen. Um, but again, talking about the ways that he deliberately took up the, the parts of the issue that might get left on the table, what are we doing to build pathways back for people that we've locked up in warehouse? Are we keeping them in this perennial state of out of society, scarlet letter, you have a record, you're always out. Um, we're gonna actually put pathways in for you to go back into the system. Um, but saying we have to break that cycle, we have to change the culture around, this is not a permanent condition. You pay your debt, but there has to be a pathway back. We can't write that percentage of society off. Um, and a lot of you can think of the political downsides of you know, going to bat for that, but it's the right thing to do, um, given where we are. Um, so I saw 13, I'm geeking out just seeing Professor Muhammad here in the front row. Um, I saw 13 and I mean even beyond seeing that, I think we all know in this room uh, sort of the long fuse that got us to this place, um, not by accident and, and it's gonna take more than eight years to get out of it, but um, I think he's made the most of his moment. So, so I actually wanna follow up on this a little bit and I think one of the, um, and we can, we can either start with Paul or we can go back and, and forth. Um, but one of the cri criticisms I think that, that has been levied at the Obama administration, especially in, in light of um, you know, the Department of Justice putting out reports after many of these kind of major incidents. So um, most recently we've had the reports put out on Baltimore, right? Um, we had a report put out on Ferguson, we've had a report put out on Oakland. All of these things in terms of um, social protests, um, criminal justice reform, police reform. Um, and one of the criticisms that has, I think, been levied at um, uh, President Obama and the Obama administration is that it's telling the same story, but where is the action? And I'm wondering if, if each of the panelists could maybe weigh in on this, because I think it connects to something important, maybe that, Brittany, that you touched on, this idea of the emergence of various social movements and how people are engaging um, with the White House. So any of the panelists want to jump in? So it was... Um uh, interesting, there was one meeting um, there had maybe about 35 or 40 people in it. Um, and the meeting ended up lasting about four and a half hours. It was um, I, myself, my colleague Duray McKesson, um, and, and Misha, a protester in Minneapolis, had all come off fresh off of protest lines, myself and Duray in Baton Rouge, Misha in Minneapolis, because this was right after the killings of um, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, respectively. And um, we're in the room with folks like Brian Stevenson, um, uh, police chiefs, mayors, um, and union heads. Um, and so I am sitting almost directly across from um, the head of the, fraternal, the National Fraternal Order of Police. And uh, being a co-founder of Campaign Zero, we put out um, a report, I'd say about five or six months ago, on just how damaging um, police unions in particular have been to issues of transparency and accountability, which when we first put it out, folks thought that we were attacking unions and we were saying, no, I used to be a union member. Actually, this is a conversation specifically around police unions and, and these practices. Um, and then as time marched on, folks figured out that this was actually a real problem. Um, but being in that conversation was interesting because I, I came with all of the things I still want to happen, right? All the things that I've named today, demilitarization, grant making, et cetera, et cetera, that I want from the federal government. I am also, however, very, very clear at how complex a system policing is, in my opinion, on purpose. Um, because when you decentralize governance around policing, there are 18,000 local police departments around the country. When you decentralize that, that means that the federal government can set a model, but you can follow that model or not. Um, and there were folks in that room who left that room pretty much proclaiming um, that they would not follow the model because it was coming from the federal government, and in my opinion, because it was coming from a black president. And so, there are certainly actions that still need to be taken at the federal level, but there are lots of actions that need to be taken at multiple levels. Um, I will, to this point about criminal justice, I think you know the, this, um, the, the piece that he did on Vice when he actually visited the, the, the active prison was critically important because it humanized people. 
right? But I don't think that we can separate conversations about race and justice and the legacy of Obama from race and justice in America, period. Mm -hmm. Because if we're gonna have a conversation about mass incarceration, we have to have a conversation about the war on drugs. Do I believe that the federal government needs to be taking more action to end the war on drugs? Absolutely. Do I also recognize that it is a uniquely American thing that heroin addiction was a problem of thugs and people who didn't care about their families when black people were addicted to heroin and now it's a public health issue that it's getting into white suburbs? That's a uniquely American issue. That's actually not about who's in the White House, right? And so I, again, no pretty bow, but I don't think that we can talk about those things separated from one another. So one thing that's, uh, that's interesting about, about criminal justice reform is that there's actually a burgeoning movement on the right uh, in mm -hmm. criminal justice reform. I was just last week at a conference in Nashville, uh, a conference of state and local conservative think tanks, where the main event was a dinner sponsored by the Charles Koch Institute, yes, that Charles Koch, uh, <laughs> on criminal justice reform. And the two guest speakers were Rick Perry, my former boss, who has dedicated his post-political career not just to Dancing with the Stars, but also <laughs> uh, to criminal justice reform, and um, the new governor of Kentucky, Matt Bevin, who's also a passionate uh, advocate of criminal justice reform. Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, has a bill that he's developing that he wants to, to pass uh, in, through the House this this fall on criminal justice reform at the federal level. Uh, and th there's been a, 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 an incredible growth on the right uh, to this idea that, hey, this is, this is a pro-liberty issue, that uh, it's not just the IRS that's bureaucratic. Police departments are bureaucratic. The justice system is bureaucratic. The way we uh, select juries is bureaucratic. And that all of these things compromise individual liberty. Uh, and, and so we're seeing, it, it, was, it started with more libertarian organizations, but it has grown. And, and I think this has been a, an opportunity for, for bipartisan collaboration, both at the federal level and at the state and local level. And I think that's gonna be one thing over the next few years that I, that I hope we continue to see. Mm -hmm. Paul, did you wanna weigh in on this? Or? Yeah, I mean, just taking off of the, the points before, all I would add is um, in terms of the action, you know, DOJ, is, as Brittany pointed out, I mean, at the end of the day, there are 18,000 plus police departments in the country. The vast majority of them are under 25 officers. Most police departments in the country are incredibly small. Half of them have under, under 10. And so the idea that the federal government's gonna stick in it's sort of its nose in and, and sort of direct the operations of these 18,000 plus departments, um, it's, a, it's a tough sort of practically speaking and you get into the issues of what is the role of the federal government. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and the sense of, uh, we were just in Newark, New Jersey on last Friday with the Attorney General, sort of a city that has a long history of, uh, of uh, challenging policing, to put it that way. Um, under consent decree, you know, the, the Ferguson, Detroit, you know, visiting these places and seeing where DOJ through the Civil Rights Division comes in, does their investigation, comes up with the, the prescription of what needs to change. You do see over time, you know, and it's not quick, I mean, you're talking years, but you have a pathway forward to get that action, to change these large organizations or smaller ones like in the case of Ferguson, um, to a place where you're using some of the recommendations uh, the task force put forward, at least stopping the abuses. Um, but that's a, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be limited in the sense of how many police departments in the country can get a pattern of practice sort of investigation leading to a consent decree. So that's just the, I think the limitation that DOJ is under. But this, this department has been incredibly, I think, aggressive. Um, I, I mean, and so many of the activists that I come across in my work, you know, and some of them as young as middle schoolers or, or high schoolers, incredibly savvy about the history, and they remind me when I show up, and I'm from DOJ, reminding me of Attorney General John Mitchell and FBI Director Hoover at a time when I, the department I work at now had a very intentional strategy about uh, black-led organizations, and they're questioning what, it, what am I even doing there, you know? So um, sort of the world we live in today, um, I think, you know, we're sort of through the Civil Rights Division, moving as aggressively as they can, and we're sort of coming alongside them in terms of how do you build off-ramps or build bridges for people to have communication where a community's broken. You know, before, long before a traumatic incident happens, you're, you're sitting on fragmented communities, and, and the work that uh, Bob Putnam has done up here at Harvard, looking at this, so the economic issues you're talking about, income equality and whatnot, I mean, the, the real divide that's going on in the country. If you live in this part of town, that side of the tracks, this side of the river, 
your school. I mean, in Baton Rouge, you look at this, there's a road. And north of Florida Boulevard, it looks very different than south of Florida Boulevard in, in almost every way. Um, and that's not a new situation, so much so that in the recent past, the southern part tried to break away and make their own city. Um, and people don't forget that, you know, so there's just so much going on here. And, um, but I think DOJ has been as aggressive as possible in using the tools that are there um, in the time we have. Just what I will add to this is there's a, a timeline to this that I think a lot of people don't know, specifically around the action of the, word, the White House on police violence. So the, um, the task force was named January of 2015. Our um, midterm report was due to the president March of 2015, and our final report was due in May. So we had about five months to crisscross the country to hear from folks, um, from law enforcement to activists, young people, um, parents of, of slain folks, um, all around the country and actually come up with a, a, a report that I believe in a lot of ways is um, on the progressive end. There are things in there around independent and external prosecutors that folks didn't want to have in the task force report at first. And we made sure we're in there around restorative justice in schools, um, around pushing for a broader look at um, criminal justice because we can't separate policing from the broader system of criminal justice. But that timeline was, was quickened in order to have um, um, conversations thereafter around how to actually institutionalize some of these practices. Because one of the things that I've learned, especially over the last two years, is that one of the great powers of the White House that we forget about is the power to convene. That if you get an email from the White House, you show up, right? No matter who's there, who's doing the greetings or whatever, that you show up to the meeting. And so that, that is how an activist could be sitting across from, from the union. Because if I'm calling them myself, which we did after we put out the report, folks don't pick up our call, right? But when the White House does, um, then, then we're forced into a conversation with one another. Um, and we have seen folks like the Police Executive Research, uh, Research excuse me, Forum that have actually adopted some of the things in Campaign Zero and pushed for them and gotten a lot of pushback for it from their peers in the law enforcement community. Right? So we've actually seen progress on some of these things. Is it not as urgent as I would like for it to be? Absolutely. Um, but I don't take for granted that the power of the White House to convene a lot of these conversations forced people to take activists uh, seriously that otherwise would have been able to just simply ignore us. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story that's, uh, that I think you, might, you two might even have more details on it than I do. I was uh, spending some time with Grover Norquist, the president of Americans for Tax Reform, the famous anti-tax organization. We were hiking in the woods in Austin. And he was telling me a story about, about, about <laughs> yeah. I know it kind of sounds kind of random to start of the story, but uh, he was telling me about this gigantic document dump that the DOJ mm -hmm. sent him and his organization about what was going on in Missouri. It turned out that something like 60% of the budgets of the police departments in these various towns in, in, in Missouri were from things like traffic tickets and other sort of nuisance uh, police actions, shall we say, I mean, you know, I, I'm using that word in quotations, but there, that there was, that they, they were collecting fines from everyday citizens that weren't about criminal activity, they were just about violations of some technical regulation. Mm -hmm. And they were using that to fund their departments because their, maybe their pension bills mm -hmm. were too expensive or whatever it was, they weren't getting enough funding that way, so they were basically assessing a kind of a tax on the local residents through these, these uh, nuisance regulations. And so they sent, the DOJ sent this, this do document dump to Grover Norquist, and Grover Norquist worked with the, uh, the Republicans in the state legislature and Democrats too, I'm sure, uh, to uh, pass a law that caps the percentage of the budget of these police departments that can come from these fines collected from these nuisance regulations. So it's, it's a very small kind of technical kind of wonky thing, but you can see how the, the impact of that downstream is pretty significant. And it all started because the Department of Justice reached out to Grover Norquist uh, <laughs> to say, hey, you should take a look at this. This is something you might uh, find offensive. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push a little bit. I won't say Please it do. all started because those papers got sent, right? It started because lots of us put our bodies of on the course. line. Of course. I don't mean to, to track no, no, credit I, from, I, right. from but, other but, people. But, I, but that's why I want to extend the narrative, yeah. right, and expand the narrative and make sure that we're thinking about it because, and this is what I meant earlier by, by thinking about this in the context of American racism because, so I, I grew up in Florissant, Missouri, which is very close to Ferguson. I spent a lot of time in Ferguson growing up. 
we knew that we knew that our government was abusing us. Like that was not news to us. Black folks knew that we were getting pulled over left and right. That was not brand new information for us. And I remember when the report on Ferguson from the DOJ came out, it was an incredibly important thing, right? That that in and of itself was action for people who were determined to believe that we were lying for people who were determined to believe that it was all hyperbole, that it was not real, that we were playing the race card, that it was somehow a figment of our imagination, that we've been profiled our entire lives. Actually, no, this is real, and it's happening in Ferguson and in Kinlock and in um, Point of Vista, like in all of these tiny municipalities across St. Louis County and in lots of other places around the country. Um, and so I wouldn't say the reports are in action, right? Because in a society that does not believe the lived experiences of people of color to be real, reports and data matter. That was one of the very first requests that was coming out of a lot of protests, was who's documenting the fact that this level of police violence is happening in our communities? Who's documenting the fact that we're being taxed with our bodies to pay for to pay people's salaries in municipalities? Um, and, and how are we ensuring that there is permanence to that story, that it doesn't just go away, even though that sacrifice that we made with our bodies to bring attention to it in the first place is critical. We know folks can erase that if they want, right? And so how do we make sure that it is on the record such that people can go to, to, go to, to Norquist and, and actually push to make the kind of legislative change that makes that not possible? So I just wanted to expand the story to, to recognize that when we talk about this, especially through a racialized lens, um, those ki that kind of documentation and data is actually critically important. So I, I just want to, we're going to open it up to questions in a couple of seconds. I want to ask one more question, though, and it may be actually kind of unfair to lob this at you guys as my, my last uh, moderator question. But it's, it, it's a bit of a two-pronged question. Um, the first is I want us to think about kind of the unique circumstances through which Barack Obama um, kind of existed as president. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the way in which Republicans reacted to him throughout his eight years in the White House. Um, I would argue that it's, it's kind of unprecedented, maybe not in the you know, 17, uh, 1700s or, or even 1800s, but in mo the modern presidency, um, the kinds of things that Barack Obama went through and the kind of obstructionism that he went through is just really um, is something that we should really pay attention to and try and tease out the racial the racialized elements to that. Um, I'm thinking specifically of somebody screaming out, "You lie!" in the middle of a speech. Right. Um, on the flip side of that, one I want us to consider as well is that increasingly um, Barack Obama has come under pressure and has come under criticism that in fact he is a respectability president right? and that in fact he has not been aggressive enough or progressive enough on issues like immigration right so what is his his nickname right deporter in chief right or on issues like education or particularly on issues of poverty and I'm wondering about how we can maybe, maybe offer an assessment of that in the next couple of minutes before we open it up to Q&A. So anyone want to jump up? Anyone want to start us off? Well, well you know, I'll, I'll say that um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's important to remember that, that it is possible to have a legitimate policy disagreement with the president <laughs> that isn't motivated by the color of his skin, because we all have views on what the best tax rate is or what the best policy for health care is. And, that can be a, a, a race-neutral issue. Uh, I will say that there is a, uh, and I, I, to, to your point about, well, has he been too incremental? I actually think President Obama will go down as one of the most productive presidents in terms of legislation uh, that we've had in, in a long time. Uh, you know, if you look at the Affordable Care Act, Dodd-Frank, and the stimulus bill, all of which were passed, obviously, early in his presidency, but that's usually what happens with presidencies. That was true of LBJ, it was true of Reagan. Um, he, these are three very large, very significant, very consequential pieces of legislation. Now, I personally don't agree uh, with a lot of the, the, uh, the outcomes of those uh, pieces of legislation, but, but in terms of his productivity, uh, it's, in, it's very, very significant. His goal was to be the liberal Reagan, and I think in many ways he was. Um, on the point of whether, uh, whether, the, whether there was this um, particular response to him as president because I think there absolutely was with a certain portion of the electorate, and that's something that I've 
uh, been spending a lot of time talking about lately. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that is, it's, it's really disappointing. Um, and, and, but I, but I, I think I, I would, I think he's handled that with a certain amount of grace. Uh, and I would also say that my hope is that over time, as the generations of people who grew up in a different America before civil rights and before the diverse country that emerged that we have today, um, uh, that, that, uh, that that attitude and that feeling will diminish. Bring your call. I think I'm, I, I, I wrestle with this all the time. Um, and again, I think so much of this is actually commentary on what we expect from black people when we assault them, peer, like when we are assaulted, period. Right? That there is always an expectation of grace, of dignity, of um, a certain magnanimity that says, I know you wronged me, but I will not stoop as low as you, you have. And I know you've been wronging me, but I will not stoop as low as you have. So thinking about you know, the, the video clip of, of the president um, and John Boehner, right, the, the spoof of them in the, um, what's it, in the theater, in the, yeah, at the Correspondence Center in the, in the White House Theater, right, joking and eating popcorn and talking about what, like, what life is like after the job, um, is an example of that grace and dignity, right? That, like, if it were me, I would have been like, I'm cool, and we don't need to film any videos. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yet, I do believe there is a broader commentary on what we expect from black people, especially in black, black people in positions of power, not to react. Because there were plenty of times when we were saying, I, you know, I, I wish he would turn up on this, right? And, and he had his moments, right? When the, during one of the state of the unions when the Republicans applauded that he has no more races to win, and he was like, that's because I want both of them, right? Everybody was at home like, oh, snap. So we all had that moment. But we also knew he couldn't have too many of those, right? Because it's a no-win situation when you're a black man. That is a no-win situation when you're a black man in the White House because you are either going to be too docile or too angry. Um, and, and being human enough to react to the things that bother you and to decide to brush certain things off of your shoulder is something that I do not believe has been afforded to him over the last eight years, both because of his position and because of his race and because of his gender. Um, and so, again, I don't have a pretty bow to tie on that one either, but I, I will say that I think often of Michelle Obama's commentary at the DNC that when they go low, we go high. And I, I wonder how much of that has just been a philosophy of theirs, period, over the last eight years. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of the first part of the question with, and, and this is another reason I think history will be kind to him, despite having pretty consistent deep-seated opposition on the Hill, a lot of things were able to get done. And you so you sort of, if it was easy, then you know, history would sort of factor that in, I would think. Um, and, and on some of the pieces, when you get into, the, I, I reject the respectability. I, I, you know, that, that piece, I think, of all my years in Obama land, I mean, one of the proudest moments, I went to Howard University for, for law school. And when the president went there to speak at commencement this past May, and he said, I mean, I just you sort of had to think about everything that came to that moment, be confident in your blackness. The different manifestations of what is being black in America mean, it can mean this, it can mean that, there is no one type of way to be. Um, you just obviously don't get that from a president uh, very often, or ever. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, ever. So I'm just saying, like, uh, with, with immigration, so certainly, I think, because I was there for the first five years, and I saw through the, the, the great efforts of people working on the immigration team led by Cecilia Munoz, you know, it, it, I don't want to get into the political part of it. I work at DOJ. I just, I think, looking back at it, it was sort of, before we talk about anything, to get a deal, let's talk about border security. Secure the border, then we'll talk. And then you did. We never talked. And, and, and what happened to, to, to me was something that, there were pieces where the Chamber of Commerce is supporting, you know, comprehensive immigration reform, a, a group that's usually not giving a lot of, you know, affirmation to the president. There was a coalition, and this is one piece, I'm, I'm really hopeful that the criminal justice reform can make it through, but I mean, how many examples have we had in the last eight years of where people are on record supporting different pieces, but no. Um, uh, and, and so I think on, on, I reject the respectability piece, I think he has done, um, done it his way, but he's allowed space for people to do it their way. Um, and, and he hasn't, uh, 
He hasn't taken the line that in order to win the respect of people or you know, be deserving of the fullness of American liberty, you have to do this and wear that and talk this way. Um, I, I don't buy that. So we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, please note that we'll be using four stationary microphones. Uh, they're here, here, up here, and up here. Um, and we ask for uh, a few ground rules um, as, you are, uh, as you come up to the microphone. One, please identify yourself. Um, we ask that you ask one brief question, brief question, no speeches per person. Um, and just a very quick reminder that questions actually end in a question mark. So why don't we start off over here? Hi, uh, my name is Shaniqua McClendon. I'm a first year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is, in, so in Congress, we have the Congressional Black Caucus. There's 42 of them. And I think oftentimes, even myself, has been critical of the president and he could do more. But they actually are not as politically as vulnerable as him when it comes to kind of speaking out, their constituencies look like them, they're probably in safe seats, but you know, they have not been doing as much as they could. So what do you think their responsibility is? And do you think that as he transitions out, they will do a better job? Maybe now they feel like they have a better platform or something to, to actually advocate for these issues because they have the power um, you know, to kind of go against Nancy Pelosi and say, we want these issues taken care of. If not, like, we're not going to support these different things that you want done. So my question is probably before that last statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, and this isn't necessarily a, about the Black Caucus or just about the Black Caucus, right? I think that this is a commentary on what elected leadership looks like, period. Because what this movement has been about is accountability, right? Is the challenge that I feel like we're facing, especially generationally, is that folks have gotten in the office and gotten comfortable, right? And you get in the office, one term, you're a fighter because you got to go and get reelected. With two terms, you get a little bit more relaxed. And three terms, you get more relaxed. And then when you're um, when your district, um, when you're redistricted in such a way that your seat becomes truly secure, then you get really relaxed and really comfortable. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to single out any single body because I actually think that this is a necessary message for, for all elected officials at any level, right? Federal, state, local. Um, you know, I sat in a Ferguson City Council meeting where they voted down, the, they voted to not fund the consent decree that was coming down from the federal government, and then the Attorney General Lynch stood on television the next day and said, if you'd like to get sued, like, that's the pathway that you're on, right? And there were hundreds of their constituents in the room telling them to pass the funding for this consent decree, and they, did, they looked them in their face and did not, right? So I think that there's a conversation about account accountability, which is why November 8th and every single day that we not only are able to vote, but also engage directly with our elected officials and require them to be accountable to us is critically important. That's why we've been out in the streets, not just because of police violence, but because we're fundamentally talking about accountability of the people that are appointed and elected to serve us. Um, and, and that's also part of the reason, I'm glad to hear you're an MPP student, that's also part of the reason why there needs to continue to be a, a, a generational influx of like young folks into these conversations and positions of, of decision making. Um, because the amount to which we are tokenized in those conversations where there's one of us or two of us um, is, is often. Um, and we are not actually going to be in a, in a different place um, if, if we don't make our presence known. You know, one, th one thing that's worth pointing out with the, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus is at least right now they're in the Demo mostly Democrats um, and, uh, and in the minority party in the House, right? So um, that may change. We don't know in, uh, in 2017. If it does, then uh, the CBC could have a lot more influence. Uh, another thing that's worth pointing out is, as I mentioned before, Paul Ryan is, is very interested in these issues. And it's possible if the CBC wants to engage with the Speaker's office on this stuff that there, uh, there could be uh, areas of progress. So why don't we go over here? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Pat. I'm an alumnus, and I'm interested in uh, Avik and Courtney's uh, answers to like basically what's a political question. Uh, I believe, from my perspective, it's a racist country institutionally, 
and that works itself out in a lot of ways. And so even um, innocuous seeming policies where you're just trying to save a buck, you're trying to balance the budget, end up working themselves out in racist ways. You want to save some money in the water system, and it hurts, hurts black and brown people usually most of the time. You want to cut some dollars from public services, it hurts black and brown people first. So right now we have like a raging crisis, and I'm afraid that it's going to distract from how malignant those pretty normal seeming policies are all the time. So how do we make sure that folks in the Republican Party don't get to walk away from how malignant uh, their little bargain hunts are most of the time and those uh, policies that they, you know, are put forward and, and we're not supposed to look out very closely until they blow up in our faces. <laughs> Well, we should, uh, we should absolutely, uh, we should uh, make sure we're always mindful of how any public policy affects low-income people of whatever uh, ethnicity or race. Uh, I do think that it's very important to distinguish between racism in the sense of active discrimination and bias and policies that have a disproportionate impact on people who happen to be minorities. I think intent does really, is really important. And I think when Isn't we conflate... Isn't that big learning of this well, time, though, that we have we to pay attention to both equally? When we, when we conflate uh, things that are intentional uh, in terms of bias that are involved, that are truly about bias action versus outcomes that happen to have a disproportionate or disparate outcome, uh, we don't do a good enough job of tackling bias. Uh, if you really want to tackle bias, if you say everything is bias, then what a lot of white people say is, you know what, I'm gonna be damned if I do, damned if I don't, it doesn't matter because it's all racism. And people just give up. Uh, and, but people, I think, are much more willing to engage if they understand there actually are instances of bias. I think the Black Lives Matter movement, the police, policing issue is one that has really broken through where people say, you know what, I'm watching these videos that people are taking from their cars and this is absolutely crazy. Uh, and so that's something uh, where I think the, the concept of, of bias is, is, has been a very potent part of the conversation. Um, so when it comes to outcomes, um, I would just substantively disagree with you. I think that uh, free markets lift more people out of poverty around the world uh, than state-based policy. Uh, and that doesn't mean that government doesn't have a role in lifting people out of poverty or uh, addressing historical discrimination, segregation, the consequences of slavery, et cetera. Uh, but I do think it's very, very important to, again, make that distinction between let's all make sure that we're focused on policies uh, that lift people up versus just assuming that because it's a disparate outcome, there's a sinister motive behind it. The foundation that I just started, this, this new think tank called the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, that's its mission. Its mission is that every white paper we publish, every scholar we hire, every op-ed that we run will have to center its arguments around moving the needle for people with below median incomes or net worth. If it doesn't, we won't put our name behind it. Now, that's not a race-based distinction. That's an income and wealth-based distinction. But I think it addresses, it, it tries to address, strives to address a lot of these issues. So, this conversation about intent versus impact is important, and I think that you're right, that there is a necessary consideration of both, right? That is why, for example, the crime bill, which was bipartisan, the 90s crime bill, um, has been such a topic of conversation because there were certainly very real concerns that folks had about crime in their neighborhoods. We also, all these years later, have come to be have come to see well-documented, very sinister uh, uh, intentions behind some of this stuff, right? And so I think that that is real. I don't think we can erase that. Um, so I was a member of the Ferguson Commission, and we adopted a policy strategy that I think is actually really instructive of just racial equity tests for every single um, for every single recommendation that we made. So we, that required two things though. That one required that from the very front end we said that this is a conversation about racial equity, that we're not going to divorce wealth, we're not gonna divorce income, we're not gonna divorce policing, education, et cetera, from the realities of racial inequities in this country. And so our lens for everything was that. And then the second commitment on the back end was to test everything in that way. So as a commissioner, um, I ha we had experts look at every single one of our policy recommendations and say, here is the potential outcome and how it could disproportionately affect folks. And that ended up changing some of our decision making. Um, and I, I, I think that regardless of which party is in charge, that is the kind of institutional change um, that should be present always in government. Up here. 
Hi, my name is Will. Uh, I'm a sophomore here at, at the college. Uh, and somebody, uh, pardon me, I forget who mentioned it, but somebody talked earlier about how during the presidency of Obama, we have seen a lot more of a conversation about race. Um, I think we've also seen um, a less nuanced conversation about race. It seems that today you are either labeled anti-cop or racist, or you believe that there's systemic racism or you're racist. Uh, and so I'm wondering, what does a meaningful, nuanced conversation look like? And how can, not just for me as a white male from the Northeast that has never experienced this kind of discrimination or racism, but for everybody, translate a real nuance and meaningful conversation into action that we can actually improve all across the country, really? I, I can just say as someone who's unfortunately twice your age, uh, that, uh, that, that I think we are having a much more nuanced conversation about race than we did uh, when I was in college. I, I think then a lot of things were called racism that were not racism, that were about political correctness more than racism. I think the issue of police bias is a, a much more significant and real issue uh, uh, that we need to address as a country than you know, whether, say, m the term master is racist, which I know has been a controversy here and at my alma mater uh, down I-95. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, think there ha I think the conversation we're having around economics, the conversation we're having on criminal justice, that's, I think we're having a much more substantive conversation. I think the president is playing a really constructive role. Um, I think what's been disappointing from my point of view is that there's been this incredible, from, a, from the standpoint as a conservative, there's been this incredible hypersensitivity to things that the president has said that are not meant uh, to be unfair or offensive in any way. People just sort of, any sort of Anything that can be read as an implication that I am a racist, I get really mad and say, hey, I'm not a racist, you're being really mean to me and you're being really unfair. And I think he's really tried to, to be very careful in how he's framed things. I don't know if that's always true in, uh, on Ivy League campuses, however. <laughs> so I uh, ap ap appreciate the question. I, so there are three things for me. One, um, in order, and I agree that I do believe that our conversation is, is more nuanced, but I believe that's because primarily people of color have forced that conversation. One, though, is to acknowledge, is to push people, both yourself and other people, to acknowledge that racism is real. Like, if you hear anybody say racism is dead because Obama was president, stop them and have a whole conversation with them, right? <laughs> and give them several books on why that is not true. Um, <laughs> Because, and, and, I, and, I say, and I say that and urge that independent of needing to see another video of a, a black person being killed in order to know that it's real, right? Because like the, the trauma of having to type another name, the trauma of having to watch another family bury another person, the trauma of seeing all of these viral videos of, of black suffering and black pain, that is enough. I, like I, we should not have to keep proving to people that we are suffering, right? So that is the first thing. The second thing um, I would say, and it is to your point, is to help people understand that calling out racism is not racist, right? So what Colin Kaepernick is going through right now is he is being called divisive simply for speaking the truth about something, silently, mind you, right? Which is like, that's wild to me. Um, because they were like, you pro Ferguson protesters, quiet down, and then Colin Kaepernick kneels quietly and they're like, no, don't protest like that. Um, <laughs> So, but there is, when, when you have always experienced privilege, equity, and movements toward equity feel like oppression to you. Because you feel like you are losing the things that actually were not rightfully yours in the first place. And so it feels like a loss, right? And so people actually have to understand that calling out privilege where it exists is not an assault on you, it is a statement of fact, right? It is a statement of truth. And that me calling it out is not me, me being divisive, it's me being observant. The last piece, though, that I would say is to do your work and not expect any other people to do your work, right? So what I mean by that is that in this complicated maze of race, there um, is power and privilege and oppression. There is also um, the existence of internalized oppression for those of us who exist in marginalized groups, right? As people of color, as women, as LGBTQ folks, et cetera. 
And if I am experiencing internalized oppression in the ways in which the oppression I have experienced um, affects me mentally, spiritually, physically, et cetera, that is enough work for me to sort through without also having to go and fix other people. And so it is really important, especially for people who experience privilege, white folks, men, cis people, uh, straight folks, to do the work of examining your privilege and understanding how you leverage it for right and help to dismantle it, um, because that's actually not marginalized people's jobs. And the more that you burden other people with that, the more destructive the conversation, let alone the work becomes, because people end up exhausted. And I don't know about you, but when I have conversations with people when I'm exhausted, they're not particularly productive. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the only thing I would say is, uh, and the Attorney General just wrapped a series of trying to convene these tough conversations around the country, and, and I know, you know we're not all going to have the AG come and visit and lead these conversations. They have to happen locally, but um, I think the, the relevant point here is uh, it had to be solutions-oriented in the sense of anybody and everyone took advantage of the, the chance to point out where they felt the DOJ was not living up to its full responsibility or where the local... Uh, police agency was doing something that wasn't appropriate, or where the police department maybe felt like the community was doing some things that were not uh, productive or lawful, um, leaving space for that. And as much as grievances are raised, what is there to do about it, um, as opposed to letting it linger to beat somebody up sort of rhetorically about past sort of issues. So I'm not taking away from sort of you have to sort of concede, you know, what, what set of facts are we working off of to go forward, but making sort of the, uh, you know, you want to share, but contingent on you sharing a, a way forward. No one's going to have the, the answer, but somebody has to think constructively about, so what do you do about it practically? And I think, as I brought up, this, this issue of uh, the criminalization of poverty. Because I, I, I would say that the media, I don't want to be the guy that says, like, the media, but I do think <laughs> they, they feed this narrative of you're either with police or you're against police, and that's it. And that is not rooted in a reality that I see as I travel. I'm sure, I don't want to speak for you all, but that's not helpful because it's not, you know, you, you meet with some of these, um, anyway, I'm rambling. I'm, I would just say um, the criminalization of poverty is one of those issues where you talk to law enforcement, they, they hate being used that way, right? Like there's a structural shortfall in the city budget, has to be made up somewhere. You all, you, you got to make your numbers because we need that money. And they don't, appreciate being used in that way either, and it undermines tr trust and confidence in law enforcement. A procedural justice problem where I don't think you give me a ticket because I actually did something wrong. I think you give me a ticket because of what I look like and what you need to make with your numbers, and, and that undermines the, the entire system. So, um, and that's an area where I think folks can come together and say nobody agrees that's a solution. We gotta do something about that. And look at what's going on in these juvenile courts, look at what's going on with the probationary system, you know, who gets out if you have money and who doesn't if you don't. Um, so that's a whole other topic, but right. solutions focus, look at solutions. All right, question up here. Hello. I'm Akinwande Lalude, I'm a MPAID one at the Kennedy School. Um, and I was wondering, wh why do you think that we're still just having a conversation about this, right? Like we're trying to, label it, we're, we're, we're trying to name it, we're trying to give it pronouns and nouns and all of these things, when, when that doesn't really help anybody. Uh, you, you don't need to know what something is in order to, to fix it, right? You don't need to know what something is in order to create a pragmatic solution for it. Why, why, why do you think people are not moving away from conversations and into the, the realm of like changing things? and, and even to the extent where we're looking at only the top and bottom of society, like, oh, there needs to be a black president or there's too many black people in jail, right? Like, when the majority of people would end up somewhere in between with problems that are much more nuanced than the, the kinds of things that you could even easily put a label to. Well, I, I would certainly agree that, that the, our use of labels is, is uh, sometimes detracts from the conversation. And, and sometimes in ways that, that you didn't even suggest. Uh, you know, one example is, you know, I think that we use the terms of racism and segregation and slavery and, and things like that so often that sometimes we forget to actually tell the stories of what it actually meant to live in a segregated part of America. 
I, one of my um, uh, roles in the presidential campaigns this past couple of years was I, uh, was a, I ran the policy shop for Rick Perry and I also helped uh, write some speeches for him. And he gave a speech in the presidential campaign where he, he told a story about a, a lynching that happened in Waco, Texas in 1916, 100 years ago. Uh, and he, he didn't use the isms. He just told the story of what happened to this teenage boy when he was dragged from the courthouse in McLennan County in Waco uh, and, and strung up. And it was an incredible moment for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons was that we talk about racism all the time, but we rarely talk about what it actually means and, and what it historically in particular has meant, for certainly, especially in, in Republican presidential campaigns. Uh, another area where I think that maybe we've been remiss and perhaps even in this conversation today is, of course, black and white aren't the only two races in America. Um, and uh, while we're on the subject of institutional racism in particular, it's, it's important to, to note that uh, this university is under a, a lawsuit or is, is in the midst of a lawsuit, a civil rights lawsuit having to do with discrimination against Asian Americans in its admissions process, something that uh, I'm, I'm particularly sympathetic to and I think is very important. And I, I look forward to eagerly following the progress of that case because I think that discrimination against Asians in the admission process of Harvard and institutions like it is a very, very important issue. Um, so there, there are areas of, of bias that maybe we're not even talking about because of, of others that are very important that we are talking about. So lots of ways we can improve the conversation, but I think all of us in this room are, are doing our best. Any, any other panelists want to weigh in? I think maybe, and maybe we can just follow up about this, because I, I worry about the idea that we actually don't have to name problems for what they are in order to solve them. I was just, I was raised that you have to very truthfully name what something is in order to dismantle it, um, because the, the power of that truth is in and of itself um, something that begins that dismantling process. Uh, I, and I would also say, though, that there is, you know, it's, it's interesting when we talk about action versus conversation, sometimes conversation is a necessary conduit to further action and, and, and is an action in and of itself. I also stand as a participant in a movement that has, that has engaged in a lot of action in order to force a conversation that has continued to force certain actions, right? And I'm not just talking about at a government level. Um, you, when you bring up issues that are happening on college campuses, there are lots of, of activists on college campuses that are forcing these kinds of issues, right? I know, for example, also here at this university, food service workers are striking right now, right? So there is more than conversation happening, um, but I, I just, I don't think that we can afford to not call things what they are, uh, because then so many people let themselves off the hook. I, I'll give you an example. So I, I have a lot of conversations about policing, um, and I push people away from using the phrase community police relations, because I'm not talking about our relationship. I'm not talking about whether or not I like you. I'm talking about whether or not you abuse your power against me. Right? I'm talking about whether or not you were accountable to me. I'm talking about whether or not you are transparent in your actions. So words matter in that way um, because they affect how you then go and make decisions. Because if you make decisions on, on a principle of community police relations, well then you think that all the problems are solved by having a basketball game and serving me some ice cream. And that doesn't save my life, right? Accountability does. You being a public servant does. You being responsible to me as your boss, as a taxpayer does. And so, Naming things what they are and talking about issues truthfully, I think, actually matters a great deal in, or, in order to think about how policy is actually created. All right, uh, right here. Yeah. My name is Glendine Hamilton, and I'm a second year MPP here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for being here. So, I have a two part question. Um, America is less than 30 days of elect within electing a new president, and to Brittany's point earlier, Black History Month will not be the same, and swag surfing may not be acceptable anymore on the South Lawn. So <laughs> looking to policy, what is one thing you believe President Obama championed that may now be on the line and with the election of a new president? And secondly, how can citizens hold our new president and other officials at the state and local government accountable to ensure that this policy issue is not removed from the conversation and that progress is not lost. Great question. I mean, depending on who ends up in office, all of it's on the line. Well, yeah. <laughs> Woo, child. Um, <laughs> I, um, 
This is, a, this is one that has been in conversation. I wouldn't say champion is the right word, but it's something that I hope to see actually taken very seriously um, moving forward. There's been, to the last question, a lot of conversation around the school to prison pipeline, right? We've seen documentaries on it, lots of stories about it, but people are really starting to dig to the depths of how this is happening. Amanda Ripley just did a really great piece in The Atlantic about actual um, statute in states that criminalizes otherwise normal juvenile behavior, right? So I think it's Maine where you can actually be fined as a student for interrupting a teacher loudly. I used to teach third grade. I got interrupted loudly all the time. That is not a crime. That is what children do, right? And so when we get past the rhetoric of that, there are actual ways that I believe the federal government can set models and grant-making priorities around incentivizing certain actions in schools, like phasing out police officers, like decriminalizing normal juvenile behaviors, like instituting restorative justice and using examples from places like Red Hook, New York, like using diversion programs instead of sending kids straight to juvenile detention centers. Uh, and so I think that those, I know that those are conversations that have been happening at the Department of Education currently and at DOJ, but I really want to see some traction on those things moving forward. Paul, do you want to uh, Yeah, I think two different roads, you know, so a lot could be, uh, at risk, I mean, yeah, Could be but uh, I, the first thing that comes to mind, I think, at DOJ anyway, this, you know, you don't get an attorney general that says all federal agents mandatory implicit bias training. There was a sobering article in, in a lot of papers, but I read the one in the Atlantic about the study that came out about preschool teachers and implicit bias that they found, uh, you know, preschool teachers, um, and then you get all the way up the line. I mean, um, the, the work that's being done around uh, making sure that the Department of Justice is focused on, on issues like that. Immigration, too, I think. I mean, that's obviously something. And, and the president has done everything he can lawfully do. I mean, he, he's the chief executive, so he will uphold the law. But within his discretion, he's done everything he can possibly do for the dreamers, deferred action, you know, th these pieces to give people a, a clear signal. You belong here. You're welcome here. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so... Those are the first, and then ACA, I mean, obviously the uh, healthcare piece. Well, you know, you know, James Madison and the other authors of the Constitution made it really hard to change laws in this country. Um, so I, I actually think a lot less is on the line legislatively than perhaps my, my co-panelists. I do think where a Trump presidency and a Hillary presidency would diverge is not so much on the legislation that would pass, it's more on foreign policy and on the executive branch. So you could imagine a Trump Department of Justice would be very different from a, a Clinton Department of Justice, particularly given that uh, Mr. Trump has taken such a strident position on uh, accusations of police bias. Uh, but I think on things like the ACA, actually, if Trump were president and uh, there was a Republican majority in the Senate, it would actually be still pretty hard to repeal the ACA, because what do you do about the, the the 20 million people who now have ACA-sponsored insurance. It's actually fairly technically complicated to come up with uh, a plan to replace the ACA that all Republicans would agree on and be able to march in lockstep, lockstep uh, to pass. That's why health reform is hard. That's why after Hillary failed the first time around, uh, it took another 15 years to get it done. So um, uh, so that's my, my caveat to, to those comments. I think we have time for one more quick question, and you are our lucky winner over here. No pressure. <laughs> my name is Kavitha. I'm a, a psychiatrist in the city, actually. And um, my point is picking backing, actually, on what Paul just mentioned about implicit bias. Something that my vocation has taught me is that it's inordinately difficult. It's a Herculean task to elicit change when the thing that we label as needing to change is enmeshed in shame and judgment. And so what I'm wondering is how do we elevate or rather expand our narrative in every sector of society, so healthcare certainly, education, criminal justice, to not talk about are we racist or not, like are we bad people or not, but how we all have implicit bias. So anybody in this room, if you haven't done this, please go to implicit.harvard.edu, take this test, close the door, don't tell anyone you're doing it, the results are gonna be terrifying to you, but labeling it, that's actually the first step to recognizing that like, hey, every single one of us need to change. But how do we elevate this on a policy level and for every sector of society? 
Yeah, you know, th this, is, this is what uh, part of what I was alluding to when I talked to, to the other questioner about defining racism very precisely. Because I think what you see a lot of times is there are a lot of people of goodwill who, who don't think of themselves as prejudiced and who actually aren't prejudiced. Maybe they're unconsciously prejudiced, maybe they aren't prejudiced at all, who, who say, hey, look, I was born after the Civil Rights Act was passed. I did, had nothing to do with segregation. Why am I being blamed for, for all these things that have happened? Why am I supposed to pay the price, whether it's in prestige or uh, economics, for something that I had nothing to do with? Uh, and, that, and that creates a kind of defensiveness and a kind of a digging in that is actually destructive uh, to the, the comedy, that, the C-O-M-I-T-Y comedy, that we all, that we all want. Um, and so it, it seems to me that it's very important to come up with a language, and I think the president has tried but it is, it's, it's a very thorny issue. Right? But, but I think we, we have to try to figure out a way to make sure that we're bringing people in and recognizing that even if people are doing things that we object to and think are biased, that often they're doing it unintentionally and, and don't realize. If, if all your friends are white and you're white, you may not realize how some of the things that you're doing or saying uh, reflect a, a bias or, or you're being indifferent to the plight of other people who are struggling and vice versa, frankly. And I think that's part of the challenge is that, that, that a lot of people today who grew, who grew up pa after the Civil Rights Act feel like they're being asked to answer for things that they didn't do. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have the answer, but I, I, but I think part of it is toning down the accusations, making the accusations when it's, when it's absolutely appropriate to do so, but making sure we're not overstating the case uh, when when we shouldn't be. I don't. Actually, can you say that one more time? I don't really think that we can overstate implicit bias. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that we're. Um, I don't believe we're asking people to pay for something that they didn't do. I do believe we're asking for people to recognize where they have benefit and privilege that they didn't earn, right? Which is different. Um, and that there are things to do with that. And I, I you know, in my workplace, um, we've done a lot of work around um, what we call culturally responsive leadership and intentional actions for equity, which end up bringing people face to face with how their biases affect themselves in the workplace and how they manage people differently across lines of difference, for example, or how they engage with their colleagues differently. Um, and one of the ways that we really try to frame the conversation that I have found helpful is to get away from talking always about safety and do you feel safe having this conversation and talking more about bravery, right? Because um, there are those of us who exist on the margins who will never feel safe having this conversation, right? I I'm, I'm in charge of the team and I don't feel, often feel safe having the conversation. How do we actually create space where people can be brave um, such that we can, because bravery is actually what gets us to a different result versus people just kind of being comfortable enough and, 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 and letting the status quo exist as it is. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just say when the Attorney General made the announcement around the training, you know, it was, it was framed as you did in the sense of as our body of knowledge has expanded, this is something we all would benefit from having. It's not sort of saying every federal enforcement agent is, is racist. It's saying that everyone comes to the table with a different perspective and maybe unconsciously, you know, brings those to the job, and, and that's why we're making the most of the knowledge. Um, so um, it, it was framed sort of that way, um, just for context. And, and I think that at least the Atlantic article I saw in terms of when they did the study, they certainly couldn't tell the preschool teachers what they were really studying. And at the end, when they do disclose it and say, you could remove your name from this because uh, now you know what it was really about. And most people, the vast majority, left it in because they, it wasn't a shame, it was a shock and something that they were learning from. Um, and so most people stayed in the, in the study, so. Yep. Okay, um, so thank you all. Uh, if we can give a round of applause to our panelists. We invite you to join us tomorrow for the, uh, for the second day of our conference. We start bright and early at 9 a.m. with our wonderful panelists, many of whom I see lurking in the audience right now. So please join us. Um, we will be over in Taubman and Nye on the, foot, uh, on the fifth floor. So thank you and have a great evening.